Well, good afternoon, or whatever time it is for you and whatever time zone you're listening to me from. Uh, good afternoon, at least on the West Coast of the United States. Welcome, everybody. If we've never been introduced before, my name is David Guzik. I am a pastor, though I'm not presently pastoring a congregation, uh, but I'm a Bible teacher, and some people know me through the online commentary that I've had and has enjoyed used by some people over the last 25 or more years, uh, originally put online by my good friends at Blue Letter Bible. God bless the fellows at Blue Letter Bible and the men and women there who do the amazing work that they do. What we do on a Thursday afternoon is I come together with you and we talk about uh, the Bible, we talk about the Christian life, we talk about things that are helpful for us right here, right now. And so um, what we do is uh, I begin with a lead question, and I'm going to get to the lead question in just a moment. And uh, hopefully everything's working well with the stream, with our viewers, with everything else. Looks good to me. So, Mr. Producer, I'm going to go ahead after I give a welcome and a greeting to our TWR 360 audience, TWR Trans World Radio 360. That's their online presence, the shortwave radio and other forms of radio broadcast from Trans World Radio. It's been a wonderful ministry uh, serving a needy world for many, many decades. Blessings and greetings to our TWR 360 audience. Okay, today's lead question comes from Josh by email. Let me read to you Josh's question here. He says, years ago, I made a rash vow to God that I would not get married and that I should be cursed if I do. I was angry and sad about my lustfulness and I did it to punish myself. I deeply regret it, but I'm not sure if I can be forgiven of it. I want to get married. I see in the Bible the importance of keeping vows. And in Leviticus chapter 27, things that are devoted to God with curses on them are irredeemable. I'm in agony over it because I don't know if I can marry or not. Will Christ forgive this or do I need help or do I need to keep it? Josh, God bless you. I want to thank you for your question. I think it's an outstanding question, one that is often neglected in our world today. And so I'm very pleased to take the time out to examine this question of yours and just ask, uh, what about vows we make to God? Uh, can they be broken? Should they be broken? Uh, what, under what circumstances can they be broken? Uh, it, does it matter if we break vows to God? I'm happy to address those questions here. But I want to give you a little preface, Josh, and everybody else who's viewing us right now. I want to let you know that we very much are um, understanding this, at least in the explanation that I give, is going to be taken... Uh, that many of the ideas and kind of the framework of my answer comes to you from this book uh, from a man I've greatly admired, even though he's gone to be with Jesus many years ago, uh, the late Dr. J. Edwin Orr in his book, Full Surrender. I think this is an outstanding devotional book. And um, his first chapter in this book is called Broken Vows. I do want to let you know that with the permission of the Orr family, we've republished that book that is uh, Enduring Word. And you can get this book on Amazon or wherever, uh, Full Surrender. I think it's a tremendous devotional book and can be helpful to you. But in his first chapter in that book, the chapter entitled Broken Vows, J. Edwinor begins with an examination of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, do you remember Ananias and Sapphira and their whole situation before the Lord? Acts chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know, in the bigger context of Acts chapter 5 right there, it was a season of tremendous generosity in the church. And there were people being noted, uh, Barnabas, for an example, in Acts chapter 4, there were people being noted for their great generosity to the community of Christians. And this was a wonderful thing. Well, because people were being noted and sort of complimented, wow, look how generous this man has been. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that a wonderful thing? Ananias and Sapphira wanted some of the praise, wanted some of the acclaim that was going to these very generous people. And basically, I know that the Acts chapter 5 text doesn't use the word vow, 
But essentially, Ananias and Sapphira broke a vow that they made to the Lord. They kept back some of the proceeds. Uh, by the way, in its um, other New Testament use of that same Greek word that's translated kept back, it means to steal. They made a vow, a promise, a pledge, if you will, uh, both privately amongst themselves and publicly saying, hey, we're giving everything. They made this voluntary act of consecration, but they didn't follow through on it. And God held them to account. Now, Josh, don't despair here, but I, I want to establish the idea that broken vows are something that God takes seriously. He took the broken vow of Ananias and Sapphira quite seriously. God knew all about the broken vow that Ananias and Sapphira made. And I would say this, that God knows about our broken vows as well. Josh, this is what I want to say to you. I want to praise the Lord that this bothers you, that you made a vow before God, and you don't know if it was a wise vow, if it was a good vow, and you're thinking of breaking it, but you don't take it as a light thing. Josh, I praise the Lord that this concerns you. Because there's other people, honestly, who break vows to God all the time, and it doesn't concern them in the slightest. That is far more worrying than the state you're in right now, Josh. I mean, think of people who make these common vows. Um, Lord, I'll spend more time in prayer. Lord, I'll pray for more others. Lord, I'll read my Bible devotionally. I'll study the Bible more intensely. I'll witness to somebody every day. I'll be more faithful in my generosity and my tithing to other to your work. I'll be a better example. I'll have more patience with my children. I'll have a personal purity regarding sexual matters. People make vows like this all the time. And they don't keep their vows before God. Now, Ananias and Sapphira seem totally unaware that they had lied to the Holy Spirit, that they had tested and provoked the Holy Spirit. But that's what the text says that they did. So, um, Ananias and Sapphira, because of their broken vow, number one, they broke fellowship with their fellow believers. But more importantly, they broke fellowship with God through their broken vow, through promising to do something for God, and then very purposefully, intentionally, not following through on it. And obviously, Ananias and Sapphira paid a price for their broken vow. Uh, in a remarkable occasion, God, um, you could say, took them home. I believe that Ananias and Sapphira were believers, but they were deceived believers. They were compromised believers. And God said, you've outlived your usefulness on this earth. It's time to bring you home. And they died. Now, this whole idea of making vows before God and not keeping them is a serious thing. Let me read to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4, 5, and 6. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? Friends, do you see what a serious matter a broken vow is before God? And again, Josh, this is why I want to pay you a great compliment. I think this is so pleasing to the Lord that it bothers you, that you're concerned about this. You see, when you go to the bank to take out a loan, what are the one of the first things they want to see? They want to see your credit record. They look at a lot of things. But one of the first things they look at is how you pay the loans you already have. Many of us, we are like delinquent debtors who keep coming to God for an extension of credit. We, we, we don't keep the vows we've made before God, but then we just keep expecting, asking for God's blessing, uh, close fellowship with God, um, a great wonderful work of the Spirit in our life. Friends, 
Broken vows are something that are serious. Let me read you a quote from J. Edwin Orr's book, Full Surrender. Again, this chapter, the first chapter in his book has been very helpful for me on this subject. J. Edwin Orr says this, Until broken vows are mended, it is difficult to make any progress along the way of consecration. Before seeking a blessing from God, one should carefully consider in honest retrospect one's previous dealings with deity. It's not enough that no affront was intended. It's not enough that no deceit was planned in advance. Well, again, I appreciate that from Dr. Orr. Okay, so um, we see from that passage we looked at in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, That it's better to not make vows at all than to make foolish vows. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4, 5, and 6, which we just read a few moments ago, really brings up this idea of the foolish vow. Now, friends, this doesn't mean that all vows before God are bad. They can be good. But it means that we must take them seriously. And Josh, now I want to speak specifically to your situation. You've made a foolish vow before God. This is what you need to do, Josh. You need to repent of it. You need to repent. You need to either repent and keep your vow, which I don't advise you to do because I believe your vow was foolish, or repent in your of your foolishness in ever making the vow and ask the Lord for release from the vow. This is what many people fail to do. Many people fail, number one, to say, this is a serious thing that I've made a vow before God that I'm not keeping. I either have to repent and keep the vow, or I need to repent of the foolishness that I made in making the vow and ask God, humbly ask him to release you from the vow. I I don't think that God is interested in binding a believer to a foolish vow And Josh, I mean, I'm not trying to be harsh with you, but I'm just saying your vow was foolish. You would understand that as well. God isn't interested in binding a believer to a foolish vow, but he wants the believer to repent of it, to repent of their foolishness. Friends, I think this is very important. Now, let me say finally on this, that we see something of this uh, in what was required for the breaking of a Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6. And I'm not going to read this passage for you. I'm just going to tell you about it. Numbers chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. You may be familiar with the concept of the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow was a special vow of consecration that a Jew in Old Testament times, and we even find evidence of it in New Testament times, could make unto the Lord. Here's a Nazarite vow. And what do you do if your Nazarite vow is broken? Well, that's addressed in Numbers chapter 6, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. And if I could just say, here's the things that are are said. I'm going to summarize that passage. Number one, you need to humble yourself before God. Hey, if you've made a foolish vow or if you've broken a vow, humble yourself before God. And number two, in the ceremony addressing a broken Nazarite vow, you were to humble yourself publicly. Listen, Josh, if you've made your vow publicly, publicly, you need to speak to people who are aware of your vow and say something like this. Hey, I made a foolish vow before God. I've repented of it before him. And I sense that God has given me release from the vow. I think you should do that. If your vow has been publicly known, if it hasn't been publicly known, then that's another thing altogether. Then you need to look to your atoning sacrifice. That's what they did in sort of the ceremony to address a a broken vow with the vow of the Nazarite. Look to your atoning sacrifice, uh, which of course is the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How grateful we are that we're not sacrificing uh, bulls or goats or lambs, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has been sacrificed on our behalf. Then in the case of the Nazarite vow, they would begin their Nazarite vow all over again. So, So look, If you've broken vows before the Lord, and even if you don't have a firm memory of them, if you know that there's vows that you made, listen, humble yourself before God, confess and repent in general terms and ask God to show you if there's specific vows that either you need to repent and start keeping again, 
or repent of the foolish vow and ask God in his grace and mercy to be released. And one more thing, Josh. You worried if you were be cursed because you did not keep this vow. I want you to remember, Josh, the Bible says that all the curse that would come upon a believer was put upon Jesus Christ at the cross. If Jesus bore the curse for you on your behalf, in your place, there's no more curse for you to bear in that situation. So, Josh, thank you for bringing up what I think is a very helpful and needful issue here with the idea of the broken vow. I think this is something that people need to give attention to and often do not give attention to. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to this issue. Friends, I just want to remind you, if you've made a vow before God and you've broken it, number one, was it a wise vow or a foolish vow? If it was a wise vow, then repent and rededicate yourself to it. If it was a foolish vow, then repent and ask God for release from it. I guess that's what it all comes down to in our conversation here with Josh. Hope that's helpful for you folks. Um, let's get to some questions here. Thank you, Mr. Producer, for our questions. Uh, we give priority to the questions that are related to the lead topic. So here's one from Johanna. She asks, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, swearing is forbidden. Seems to say that swearing in general is bad and comes from the enemy. Can you expound on that? Oh, no longer swear anymore, but I used to tons when lying in the past. Okay, Johanna, thank you. Thank you for that question. All right, first of all, Johanna, I love the way that you phrased your question because you talk about how you used to swear, especially when you were lying a lot in the past. And that is exactly what Jesus was addressing in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths before the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, where God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Johanna, the exact kind of swearing or oath-making that Jesus forbade in the Sermon on the Mount was exactly what you're talking about, was swearing or oath-making to cover for lies. In that day, among some of the Jewish people, look, sometimes we talk about certain practices were universal among all the Jewish people in the world at that time. Not necessarily, but at least among some of the Jewish people at the time, they would have formulas where they could make oaths or swear oaths and still deliberately lie. Uh, this is sort of a colloquial thing. Um, it, it's, a, it's a local practice, at least when I was growing up as a kid uh, in uh, America. What, we used to have this thing that if you made a promise but crossed your fingers and held your fingers crossed behind your back, you were not bound by that promise. Uh, I promise to let you ride my bike. Oh, my fingers are crossed. I don't have to keep it. Well, the, the Jewish people, or at least some of them at that time of Jesus, had elaborate ways that they could say words, but essentially it was understood they didn't have to keep their oath, but it sounded like they did. That's what Jesus was telling us not to do. Now, the reason why I don't believe that this was an absolute prohibition of swearing oaths is we find on a few occasions, number one, um, the apostles swearing oaths in, in the right occasions. And we find that God himself swears oaths. Um, in Hebrews, it's talk about oaths between the father and the son. So I, I don't think that this is absolutely forbidding every kind of oath, but certainly it's forbidding frivolous oaths and oaths that are made to hide the truth. And uh, that's exactly what Johanna mentioned in her question and I want to thank her for that question. Good good question here. Uh, but again, uh, because we find godly men and women in the scriptures, and including in the New Testament, swearing oaths, and we find God himself swearing oaths, uh, those are some of the things that lead me to believe that this is not an absolute prohibition for all times. Hope that's helpful for you there, Johanna. Uh, let me go to the next question here from, uh, what, well, another one? Related to the lead question, uh, Burger Bun asks this, I am a 
in a Christian couple married 12 years. It's been a rocky marriage and we're both difficult. I want to work on things, but if he keeps pushing for separation, potential divorce, do I give in? I love him, but he doesn't love me anymore. Burger Bunn, um, I'm very sorry to hear about your situation. And in the difficulty that you have in marriage, you're not alone. There are many people uh, in what should be Christian marriages who experience this very difficult season that you're talking about here. Uh, listen, you made oaths before God. Now, your, your partner, your husband did as well. And, and something's not right in the fulfillment of those oaths. Now, I can't tell you right now uh, if you should uh, agree to a divorce with your husband. I, I certainly cannot tell you that. But because, first of all, I, I have no idea if there are biblical grounds for divorce. I believe that the Bible gives grounds for divorce. And there are problems in marriage that sometimes don't fall within that grounds. I do also think that the Bible gives reason or the principle for separation. If you want more on this, go in depth in my teaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You can find it online uh, on my YouTube channel. Or you can find it in text at EnduringWord.com, my Bible commentary that walks carefully through these issues in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There is a principle where God does give permission for divorce in certain circumstances. And then there's other principles where God gives permission for a separation. In other words, in the separation, people aren't regarded as being divorced. They're still regarded as being married, but they can't live together either but they still have to be faithful to their marital commitment, to their marital oath. So uh, I can't tell you which situation this falls into. Th this needs direct, careful, pastoral counsel. Y you need to get together with a wise pastor and walk through these things from a biblical and a practical perspective and see how the practical applies, how the biblical applies to the practical, and the practical relates to the biblical in your marriage. So it may be that God would give the principle that uh, the marriage vow has been violated, uh, that the marriage vow has been so violated that, that uh, under certain terms that God gives, that a divorce would be allowed, uh, or it may be a separation, or obviously, obviously, the greater solution is for God to do a wonderful work in your husband and in you and to heal, to, to make what's good out of something that isn't good and is falling so far short. So what you really need, Bergman, for this is some wise pastoral counsel that really gets into the depths of your situation. And I know one of the things that may be super difficult with this is that your husband may not be willing to do this. That's one difficulty. Another one, sometimes it can be very difficult to find wise pastoral counsel. But this is really what would address the questions that you have. But you're right in applying these general principles to keeping vows to the issue of your marriage. Thank you for that. All right. A uh, couple questions come in before that, not so related to the uh, lead topic today. Here's one from Radix, who asks, Pastor David, in my own personal assessment as a Christian, and from what I study of what Jesus taught to his disciples, to his apostles, is that if you will go and preach the good news, and there's someone who will not believe and accept him, we should leave them and go to another place. So that is what I'm doing now. Am I right and correct? God bless. Well, R Radix, yes. I believe that in general principle, if people will not receive what God would speak to them through the gospel, if they refuse to receive it, that um, it's not our duty to keep hammering away at them. Um in their rejection. It, it's usually wiser and more fruitful to go find somebody who does want to hear. Now, I do believe that there could be very much spirit-led exceptions to that general principle. So if you would feel guided by the Holy Spirit 
to specifically uh, continue on in a place, even though it's not being received, well, then I think you should listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But as a general principle, I think you're spot on with this. So hope that's helpful for you there, Radix. Uh, next question comes from Gamet, who asks, Hello, Pastor David Goose. My question is, what is anointing? Okay, Gamet, thank you for that question. I love these very basic questions about the Christian life and what it means and, and just kind of what the vocabulary is for us as Christians, as believers. So here is a good way to understand anointing. Anointing originally has the idea to apply or typically oil, it could be other things, but let's just say oil, is to apply oil to somebody on their head. Normally, although the feet could be anointed or this or that, but let's just think in normal practice, anointing was to take a bit of fragrant oil and apply it to a person's head. Maybe it could be a little bit just to give a fragrance and sort of a cooling sensation, Maybe it could be a lot, as in the anointing described in the Psalms that ran down the beard of Aaron. So the idea there is anointing is an application of oil. Uh, now, again, you, you could talk about an anointing with water, anointing with this substance, that, but kind of the basic biblical idea is a application of oil. Now, here's the thing, is that throughout the scriptures, oil is a picture an emblem, a symbol of the Holy Spirit and his work. And there's many reasons for this, uh, but the idea of the applying of oil as an anointing and the idea that anointing is a picture, a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit, those ideas connected came to have the significance that anointing is the... Um, bestowing of the Holy Spirit upon a person. Oh, I'm anointed with oil. The oil is upon me. Oh, um, I'm anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is upon me. Again, this is taking a symbolic idea, the application of oil to somebody's head, and taking that symbol and relating it to the work of the Holy Spirit. So, in normal Christian vocabulary, when we talk about a person being anointed, we mean that they have had the Holy Spirit bestowed upon them. Now, this is true for believers in a general sense. John says in 1 John, speaking to all believers, you have an anointing. There is a sense in which everyone who is a believer Everyone who names the name of Christ has an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and we praise God for it. However, there is sort of a secondary way that the anointing can be understood, is that when God gives a unique bestowal of the Holy Spirit upon a person, a unique bestowal to exercise a spiritual gift, to meet a particular challenge, to, to rise and to fill a particular need, uh, that could sort of be understood as a unique example or outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So this idea of anointing for believers, it is legitimately understood in a general sense. Praise the Lord for it. Every believer has an anointing. But there may be a time and a place where God fills a person with his spirit to do a particular work. I think it's interesting in the book of Acts that there are several times where it says throughout the book of Acts that the disciples were filled with the Spirit. There they were, filled with the Spirit again and again. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that God bestows upon his people, uh, both in a general sense, everyone who's a believer, but then also in a particular or specific sense. Hope that's helpful for you there, Gamut. All right, next question comes from uh, Radix, who asks again. Um, no, no, wait, I got those again. All right, next question comes from uh, Tunol Banan Shugothre. Let me take a drink here. Okay, Tunol Banan Shugothre asks, uh, Hello from Sweden. Who will take part of the millennium reign of Christ? All right, you're asking me 
So I'm going to give you my understanding of this. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm the only one in the Christian world who has this. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is a view that's held by a fair amount of people in the Christian world today, in the evangelical world. But there's many people who believe differently. So I'll give you my answer. I believe that there are two basic groups of people to understand regarding the millennium. Number one, there are the citizens or the inhabitants of planet Earth. Those are the people who survive the Great Tribulation and who are regarded as the sheep in the uh, judgment of the sheep and the goats uh, that Jesus described sort of in parabolic form in Matthew chapter 25. Those are the inhabitants of the millennial earth. And look, if I could just guess, please don't hold me to this because it's just a guess, but there might be a billion, half a billion people on earth who survive the Great Tribulation and who are regarded as the sheep and not the goats and allowed to enter into the millennial kingdom. And, and they will not be resurrected. They will not be, or not until they die. They're, they're survivors of the Great Tribulation. They enter alive into the millennial reign of Christ. The literal, personal reign of Jesus Christ uh, himself, and then also through his deputies, if you want to say, through those who will help him serve over the earth. That's one group. Here's the second group glorified, resurrected saints who help Jesus in the administration and the rulership of planet Earth. That's part of reigning with Christ. That's part of his servants serving him. That's part of the responsibility for different cities or places given to people in the millennial kingdom. But those people are people who have died, been resurrected, and glorified. So uh, you have glorified, resurrected saints. That's one group. And they are, um, I don't know if you would say they live on the millennial earth. Maybe they have free concourse back and forth between uh, the New Jerusalem. Well, the New Jerusalem comes down to earth, but I believe that's at the end of the millennial reign. Between heaven and earth, let's just say that. Perhaps they have free concourse there. Uh, even as we would express some angelic beings have free concourse right now between heaven and earth. So there's that idea of those who rule and reign with Christ, glorified, resurrected saints, and those who are the ruled, the inhabitants on planet Earth, who are the beneficiaries of the reign of Christ. So that's why I would say it takes place in the millennial reign of Christ, uh, those two groups, um, those who reign and those who inhabit, the citizens of Earth. Hope that's helpful for you there. All right, we're going to get to another question here from You Make the Choice. Here we go. I made a vow to God to be a missionary. Then I got married. My husband is in seminary but has not received his calling. I give out the gospel to anyone who will listen. Am I not keeping my vow to God? Okay, you make the choice. I would say you are keeping your vow to God. And... There may very well be a greater sense in the future which you keep the vow of God in an even more obvious sense. Now, when you made a vow to God to be a missionary, you, you were probably thinking going to some uh, less developed place of the earth. That's the way many people think of being a missionary. I'm going to go to this place or some dangerous place on earth. I'm going to go somewhere in the Muslim world. I'm going to go somewhere in the totalitarian world. I'm going to go somewhere in the, in the undeveloped world and I'll be a missionary and I'll do those things. Well, that's probably what you had in mind. But maybe God has you living out your life and heart of a missionary right there where you are. But I want to tell you, you make the choice, that it may very well be that in the future... God may have a greater fulfillment. Who knows if God will not call you and your husband out to the mission field at some later time. I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen God do things like that in my own life, in the life of my wonderful wife. Who I don't know if she made a vow to God, but she certainly had a desire to go minister on a mercy ship doing dental care 
And God fulfilled that promise. Oh, heavens, what was it like 20 years later or something like that? 25 years later, uh, God did that. Not when she thought it would happen, but much later. So it may very well be that same way with you. You make the choice. Uh, so I would say, yes, you are keeping that vow right now. And there may be an even greater sense in the future in which you keep that vow. All right, before I move on to the next question, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, thank you for viewing in today. I hope that maybe my Bible resources can be of help to you. Uh, if you ever want just some very practical, down-to-earth, accessible help in understanding the Bible, go to the Bible commentary at EnduringWord.com. I have a verse-by-verse -verse commentary throughout the entire Bible. Uh, and when you say commentary, maybe you're thinking of a highly academic or, you know, uh, uh, something written with great theological detail, something above your head. Uh, listen, um, what, what I've written over the years is accessible by everyday people. So some people use it just for their daily Bible reading. Some people use it for um, just edification. But if it helps you, praise the Lord for it. That's one resource. Another resource I want to make you aware of is, hey, if you're a pastor we have a Sunday school class or, or a small group. We have produced a series of short, uh, anywhere from five to seven minutes, videos relevant to the Easter season. There's one relevant to Palm Sunday. There's another one, uh, several uh, related. Uh, there's one related to the Last Supper. There's uh, a couple related to Good Friday. There's several related to uh, Resurrection Sunday. These videos are available on the Enduring Word website. I believe the web address is EnduringWord.com slash holidays. I, I think that's the web address. If not, probably with some Googling, you can find it. Uh, Mr. Producer, maybe you can put a link to that in our uh, description notes in the live chat. And these are downloadable videos for you to show to a congregation, a Sunday school class, uh, whatever. We're happy for people to use them. Uh, at least in the way that we prescribe. Listen, I, I don't want you republishing on your own YouTube channel saying these are your videos because they're not your videos. They're our videos, but we're happy to let other people use them uh, in the way that we intend for them to be used. And then thirdly, and I'm just saying this before I get on to the next question here, your prayers are appreciated. Tomorrow, I'm flying to Brazil. I'm going to spend a couple weeks with the wonderful people at Calvary Chapel Sao Vicente in uh, Brazil. Uh, that's a beach community outside of Sao Paulo. And I'll be there for a couple of weeks. And I'm going to be teaching at the new Bible college work that they've started there. They have a Calvary Bible Institute that they've started there at Calvary Sao Vicente there uh, in that area of Brazil. Uh, I'm excited about going and helping out that work. God willing, and if I live and everything comes together, next Thursday, I'm going to be doing this broadcast live, hopefully at the same time and everything, live from Brazil. And hopefully I'll fill you in on how things are going with the Bible college class that we're doing. I'm going to teach you the book of Romans, and I'm very excited to do that. All right, let's get on to the next question here from Marsha, who asks, Will babies and young children that are innocent be raptured? If so, will the world go into chaos or would it be explained away or covered up? Thank you from Marsha in Perth, West Australia. Marsha, um, I don't think the Bible speaks with great clarity to your question. I can give you some principles here. I would say that babies and young children of believers, I would say, we have confidence that they would also be taken in the catching away of the church that Paul described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And on what basis do I say that? Well, because uh, Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians that the presence of a believing parent in some way, I, I got to say, I don't understand in every way. There's some things about this passage that are a little mysterious to me, but in some way, uh, the presence of a believing parent sanctifies the children in the home. And uh, I would think that it's very likely that that sanctification work means that those children are set apart, uh, considered as a part of God's people and taken away with the rest of God's people 
in the catching away of the church, again, that Paul described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Regarding those who are children of people who are not believers, I don't think we have the same basis for saying that they will be caught up, that they will be taken away, raptured, if you will. Uh, I don't think we have that same confidence. Perhaps, I would say perhaps. But look, if judgment is coming upon the world, people who are relatively innocent will experience some of the pain and some of the the heat of that judgment. That's how it's always been. Look, I I I don't want to talk about this in a flippant way. This is sobering stuff to consider. But babies and children died in Noah's flood. Babies and children died when God rained down fire from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. When God judges a city, a nation, a community, there are people who may not have any or much individual guiltiness in that community who are judged as being part of that community. Now, that doesn't necessarily, that in itself, doesn't necessarily mean that that person goes to hell. I'm not saying that but they suffer under that judgment that has come upon a community, a nation, a city, whatever it would be. And to teach otherwise is really to fundamentally deny the right of God to judge a community, a nation, a city, whatever. So uh, the bottom line with it, uh, Marcia, is that uh, I believe that we have a scriptural confidence I wouldn't say 100% sure, but a scriptural confidence for saying that this would be true of the children of believers. But uh, we would merely have a hope, let's put it that way, for those who are not believers. All right, let me go to the next question from Eliza, who asks, Hello, Pastor David, uh, Pastor Guzik, love your enduring word. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, Satan is bound during the thousand years. Why must he be released for a short time? Why not leave him there for punishment? Thank you so much. By the way, Eliza, let me just say that one of the many reasons why I believe that we are not in the millennium right now, uh, are all millennial brothers and sisters would say that we're in the millennium right now, that, that Christ is reigning. And of course, I would agree that there is definitely a sense in which Christ is reigning right now. Absolutely true. But I would just insist that there is a greater sense in which there's a reign of Jesus Christ to come, that we're awaiting a greater sense of his reign. But one of the reasons why I do not believe that, not the only reason, is because of the passage that you're speaking about right here. Because I believe in this Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3 passage that you made reference to. In the strongest possible terms, God says that Satan will be bound during the millennium. He'll be bound. That he will absolutely be bound during the... He will cease from his activity. And as I look at the world today, and as I look at how the scriptures describe the work of Satan today, that he walks about... Uh, roaring as a lion. The Bible tells us that Satan is active right now, but it describes this thousand-year period, th- this this millennium, if you will, as a period when Satan's activity will absolutely be ceased. So the two don't jive for me. Now, you ask, why is Satan released at the end of that? To stir up one final rebellion, and again, um, Eliza, I would say for this reason, to show that a thousand years of perfect administration by the Son of God over this earth did not fundamentally change the heart of man. That no, instead, it takes an individual work of conversion to change the heart of man. That as soon as mankind had the opportunity to join Team Satan, he did. Now, God brings a swift and conclusive judgment to that, no doubt about it. But this is to demonstrate that mankind's problem 
is not fundamentally with his environment because God gives humanity a thousand years of the absolutely best environment conceivable. And at the first opportunity, man rebels against God. I think that's a very important principle for God to not only declare verbally, but declare in practice through the thousand year millennium when Satan is bound, but then released to draw rebellious humanity after himself. Eliza, I think that's one of the great reasons. There may be additional reasons beyond that, but that's what I think of fundamentally. All right, let me go to the next question here from Caroline, who asks, uh, I have a question. You say in your video on Psalm 91 that verse 3 is not considered an absolute promise of God, but you would say that verse 4 is an absolute promise promise of God? If so, how do we distinguish from absolute promises in his word versus not? How do you know that both are not absolute promises? Thank you. Carolyn, what a great question. And again, I don't have my commentary on um, Psalm 91 right in front of me. I could go to it here. Psalms uh, 91. Let me see if I can bring this over to another page here. Here we go. Psalm 91. That's uh, my work there on that. Uh, introducing the psalm and such and going through it. Uh, but let me just go from the passage that you're speaking about here, uh, these particular verses. Um, you say that it's not considered absolute promise. Verse 3, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, and from, um, and from the perilous pestilence. Verse 4, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. All right, well, Caroline, let me just say, you ask, I believe, a very good question about this psalm. Under what principle do I say Verse 3 is not an absolute promise, but verse 4 is an absolute promise. And I think it's fair enough. And Caroline, I'm just going to lay my cards on the table and tell you how I see this. I base this on the basis of practical experience of believers. In other words, I would say that there have been faithful believers who have died in times of plague and pestilence. So verse 3 says, he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. In other words, that's saying that God will deliver his people from plagues. And there are faithful men and women of God who have died in times of plague. You I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right for somebody to stand back and say, if a person dies in a time of plague or pestilence, it's evidence that they were not a faithful man or woman of God. So I think that that is true. And so on that basis is really, I'm just laying it out before you. That's the basis on which I say that that's not an absolute promise of God because I'm not ready based on what I know from other passages of scripture and what I know from just... Uh, practical living and life experience, I'm not ready to say that you can determine whether or not somebody is a faithful man or woman of God by whether or not they die in pestilence. So I think that's a general promise. But then the promise in verse 4, he'll cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. I think that that's obviously things that can be exhibited and given to God's people in and throughout all times. So listen, I have to say, um, Caroline, sometimes I just get terribly practical. Uh, I think we're showing over. Are we showing over here? Yes, we are on this. Um, we're showing over here on verses three and four in my commentary where we talk about this, the fowler, the perilous pestilence. So uh, again, I, I give some quotes there from other uh, passages. I, I would invite people but, Carolyn, you are asking an entirely fair question and one that I'm happy to answer, and it's really based on personal observation. There is nothing inherent within the text itself that makes me say that. It's in how I see that text applied. And just being from this thing, 
I'm not ready to say that everyone who has died in a plague, everyone who has died in a pestilence is um, and not a, is not a faithful man or woman of God. All right. So hope that's helpful for you there. And uh, I, I'm grateful for questions like that. I think they're well asked. All right. Next question comes from Grace, who asks, Hi, Pastor. Thank you for you and your team for the blessed work you're doing on Bible commentary and YouTube work. By the way, Gracie, thank you for mentioning our team. Look, I, I'm the one in front of the camera right now. Uh, I'm the face that more people, what a wonderful team we have in Enduring Word. Uh, we have the team that rarely appears on camera, uh, our producer, um, our general manager, our, our internet content sort of director and coordinator. You could go online to EnduringWord.com and see the pictures of these people. Uh, bringing on a new social media person right now. Uh, but then also my partner in pastoral work and content providing here, uh, Pastor Lance Ralston, who's putting out great content on our channel right now, especially his church history stuff right now. It's just absolutely stellar. So, Grace, I'm just grateful that you mentioned that this is part of a team's work. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, plus, I'm not even counting all the translators and editors that are part of our Enduring Word family and team. It's a big work happening. Okay, um, Grace says, Hi, Pastor. Thank you and your team for the blessed work you're doing on Bible commentary and YouTube work. What are your thoughts on infertile couples who want to wait on God instead of uh, IVF? Does God allow IVF so that we can utilize it, or is he calling us to wait until he makes fertility possible without it? Grace, I'm going to give you an answer, but I don't expect that you would take my answer as being the final word on the subject. Grace, I want you to know, I don't think I know enough about the medical procedure of in vitro fertilization, IVF. I don't think I know enough about the procedure. I don't think I've studied enough to give you uh, a, a more confident one that I am going to tell you right now. So I, I'm happy to give you my perspective. But um, I, I would just hope that you wouldn't say, well, whatever Pastor David says settles it. No, 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 no. But I'm, I'm happy to add my word to whatever. Grace, I believe that this is a matter that should be left up to Christian conscience. Again, maybe if I studied it more, I'd come to a different opinion. And I, I understand that. But, but as of now, if somebody asked me, David, I'm pressing you, give me an opinion— Here's my perspective, that it should be left up to a matter of Christian conscience, that a husband and a wife should prayerfully consider in light of everything that they know about the procedures and, and ask God to guide them by his spirit, whether or not it is for them or not for them. There are certain things in the Christian life that are really a matter of the spirits dealing with the individual believer. They're not a universal commands for every believer. We know this by principle uh, having to do with the whole situation of meat sacrifice to idols that's dealt with in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians and Romans particularly deal with that. It's also mentioned a few other places in the New Testament. But we see that the whole result from that was that this was a matter left up to Christian conscience. And some Christians were absolutely convinced that eating meat sacrificed an idol was wrong for them and they should never touch it. And there were other Christians who were absolutely convinced that they had full permission from God to eat meat that was sacrificed to an idol. And Paul said, seek the God about this and be guided by the Holy Spirit and don't violate your conscience. For me and my study right now, I would put IVF in that category. And so I would advise you and your husband to prayerfully seek the Lord about this and go with what you believe the Holy Spirit leads you, guides you to do. And uh, do it in faith. If you don't get the IVF treatment, do that in faith. If you do get the IVF treatment, do that in faith. Uh, this is an area that I think the Holy Spirit should speak to each individual Christian conscience about. Again, that's my perspective. I'll admit it's somewhat of an uneducated perspective, but uh, I don't want to duck questions just because I'm not an expert on them. Okay, I think we're up to our lightning round. Thank you, Mr. Producer. 
Last week, he took pity on me and gave me a short lightning round. He saw that I was tired, had a lot going on. Um, I think the mercy's gone. Here we go. Lightning round number one. He is returning soon. Asks, is church membership considered a vow before God? Um, well, it can be. People, Look, I don't think God tells us to make certain vows. Vows are what we make unto him. Now, there are certain commitments that are automatically a vow, like a marriage commitment, but that's a vow people voluntarily make. So if you will be wed by a vow to a congregation, that's up to you. I really think that's what it's talking about there. So um, church membership among God's people is a fact. We being many, Paul wrote, we being many are one body in Christ and members of one another. That's the most important church membership. The membership that is just a fact among the community of Christians. Now, does formal, recognized church membership have a place in the congregation? Yes, and God has used it to great effect, so I'm not going to judge a church one way or another for whatever their particular practices are regarding membership. But I would stand strong on the principle that the most important membership is the membership that God has declared, for ye being many are one body in Christ, and your members one with one another. That's not accomplished by a vow that we make. That's a fact of a person being in Christ. Hey, look, if you're in Christ, if you're a believer, I'm your brother and you're stuck with me. That's all there is to it. And you know what? I'm stuck with you. And so we got to learn how to get along and, uh, and to be believers walking one with another. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Stan. Regarding the flood and the story of Noah, how did Noah know which were clean and unclean? Stan, great question. The text doesn't tell us, but since there was the concept of sacrifice already existing among humanity at that time, we find the principle of sacrifice going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And, and no one knew about sacrifice because when he got off the ark, he sacrificed animals. Because there was a system of sacrifice it just must have been understood among humanity that some animals were approved for sacrifice and some animals weren't, that there were clean and unclean animals. And I think that that's what clean and unclean means in that context, either allowed for sacrifice or not allowed for sacrifice. And I, I think that's what it's getting at. And you're absolutely right. The text does not tell us how no one knew this, but I think it was just understood among humanity as part of general revelation to humanity. All right, next question comes from Sandy, who asks, Pastor Guzik, are you able to give your thoughts on Reverend Billy Graham? I'm conflicted, but I trust your thoughts. Maybe you can't answer this for me. Okay, Sandy, I don't regard myself as a Billy Graham expert, but um, I've listened to a fair amount of Billy Graham. I've, uh, I've watched a fair amount of Billy Graham. Um, I've read some of his books, of course. I, I would put it like this, Sandy. If Billy Graham had any failings, well, any failings, everybody has failings, but the, the failing that Billy Graham is most commonly criticized, not the only thing, but the thing he's most commonly criticized is for being very ecumenical. And I would just say this, Sandy, that is in the nature of evangelists. Look, evangelists by their very nature are going to be I want to keep as many open doors as possible because I want to reach as many people as possible. Now, not everybody in the body of Christ is like that. There's pastors who have stewardship over a particular congregation. And by the very nature of their responsibility and calling, they are going to be more closed, so to speak, in what they allow, in what they accept. Look, I believe that there's a place in God's family for open evangelists like Billy Graham. But I also believe there's a place in God's family and in God's community for more closed pastors protecting a local flock. So the main, not the only, but the main failings that I would see in Billy Graham are things that I would say were connected to his very much calling and heart as an evangelist. And, uh, I think it's wrong to expect evangelists to be just like pastors. 
to be just like apologetics people or whatever you want to say. Evangelists have a different calling. So thank you for that, Sandy. Next one comes from North Cal Gospel Herald. Is the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew the same as the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, North Cal, I would say yes. I know that there's people trying to make a distinction. Some people have the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of heaven, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, we're talking about the good news. That's what gospel means. The good news of the kingdom is the same thing as the good news of Jesus Christ. There's not a difference. There may be slight nuanced differences between the two, but but overall, in the main, they're the same thing. Uh, Sandy, different Sandy, I gather, asks, why did Satan want Moses' body, and why did he fight with the archangel Michael? I'm ignorant on some things. Well, Sandy, again, uh, we're dealing with things that the scriptures don't specifically speak on, so I'm going to give you an answer, but I just want to know that this is somewhat speculative. The scriptures don't specifically speak on this, but I'm happy to tell you what I think here, uh, speculating a bit. Isn't it interesting that God had a purpose for Moses later to appear at the Mount of Transfiguration to Jesus Christ and in front of Peter, James, and John. I think those were the only apostles present there at the Transfiguration. Maybe God wanted the body of Moses preserved in some way for that later work. There could be a connection to the work later on of Moses appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ together with um, the fact that there was a contention over the body of Moses uh, between Satan and the archangel Michael. Maybe Satan wanted to desecrate or destroy or do something with the body of Moses that God said, no, I got a purpose for him. He's got an appointment to keep on the Mount of Transfiguration a few thousand years from now. And uh, maybe that was the whole purpose behind it. That, that would be the best speculation I could offer for you on that one, Sandy. Uh, Isa asks, what is the epistle to the Laodiceans? Uh, why is it not in the Bible? Uh, Isa, I got to look that up. Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Um, if you'll give me just a moment here. I know this is the lightning round, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look that up in my commentary. Colossians chapter 4, go down to the verse 16. What do I say about the epistle to the Lycians? Um, okay, here's what it says, verse 16 here of, um, hopefully I've cut over to that screen here now. Uh, now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Here's what I comment on that. I'll just read you from my commentary. Uh, apparently, Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans that we do not have. We should not assume from this that our treasure of inspiration is incomplete. The Holy Spirit has chosen to preserve those letters that are inspired for the church in a universal sense. Paul was not inspired in this way every time he set pen to paper. Well, I, I hope you understand what I'm getting at there um, with that, Isa. Um, this was just a letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. Why is that not the Bible? I believe that what God had preserved in the New Testament collection of letters was what was applicable and helpful for all the church throughout all ages. Now, I have no doubt that what Paul wrote to the Laodiceans was helpful for the Laodiceans in their time and place, but it was not helpful for all God's people throughout all ages, as is Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, the rest of it. So really, uh, that's just simply how it is. And it also shows that these letters that Paul wrote were exchanged among churches in that day. That's a very interesting thing. There was an early recognition of uh, that Paul was saying something important from God. Okay, final question here from Dan, who asks, What do you think of church Easter egg events? I feel as if this cheapens the magnitude of Christ's work. Why do so many churches focus on entertainment and not the word? Dan, um, I would make a distinction between a basically church picnic where the kids have fun hunting for candy in Easter eggs. I would be okay with that at a church. Not, not that I think a church necessarily should do that or demand that they do it, but I would be okay with that if 
they had a proper church service celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, worshiping the resurrected Jesus, and preaching the word. I'd be okay for them to do both. I don't want entertainment to replace the preaching of the word. And so I think that there needs to be a distinction between the. I think that you could have two separate events, a family oriented thing that's fun for the kids, finding, you know, candy and eggs and all the rest. That's fine. As long as there's uh, definitely a service where Jesus Christ is glorified and his word is proclaimed. So you're right, Dan. There are a lot of churches that are way too focused on entertainment, way too focused on just, you know, things that are outside um, the real focus of the church. And that's a danger in the world today. I hope that you all can, can be connected to a church family that loves Jesus, worships God in spirit and in truth, and really exalts God and his word, uh, because that's what God wants us to do. He has um, exalted his word above his very name, as it says there in uh, Psalm 139, verse 2. Uh, that's the Blue Letter Bible verse, and that's the shirt I'm wearing today. Well, Mr. Producer, I want to say thank you for a wonderful program today. As I've said before, God willing, and if I live, everything goes okay. Next week, I'm going to be coming to you live from Brazil. I appreciate your prayers for this trip. And your prayers in general for the ministry that we do together as Enduring Word. God's given us a great team, and I'm very grateful for it. So thank you for joining us today. God bless you, and I hope to see you another time. Bye-bye.